Coming up on Garden Talk. It's really important to visit that site many times of the day. You know, go there in the morning, go there in the evening, go there, go there sort of midday. In amongst the other plants, it's sort of, it looks like stinging nettles. It could be anything. It's sort of a sort of green mass, isn't it? I mean, it, it seems nothing. Best advice I could have is get yourself a dog. Or if you don't have a dog, buy yourself a dog lead. Because <laughs> at least if you're found out in the wild and you've got a dog, you can protect, at least pretend you're looking for your dog. It's really easy to get down the rabbit hole and it's amazing and it's so much fun and it's it's so many good positive things it's amazing for your mental health it's it's all those good things and i can't recommend it highly enough but have an understanding of consequence and just have an exit plan what's up everybody if you that don't know me my name is chris aka mr grow it and you're tuned into the Garden Talk Podcast. This episode number 96. In this episode, I interview Mr. Poodle420. He has been gorilla growing for 20 years and grows fully organic. He talks all about his methods growing outdoors and how to stay stealth about it. If you gain value from these podcast episodes, please click the like button and also subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. That way you can be notified when new episodes are released. If you'd like to support even more, visit patreon.com slash mrgrowit. There are various rewards set up for those that support and you can pledge any amount that you'd like. 100% of the money pledged through Patreon goes right back into the podcast. So thank you so much for your support there. Before we get into it, I want to acknowledge that one of my goals for this podcast is to bring free gardening information of all plants to the general public. That being said, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's episode who helped make that goal possible. Thanks to AC Infinity for sponsoring this episode. My entire ventilation system is AC Infinity. I have their inline fan, ducting, carbon filter, and their controller. I love the Controller 69 Pro with temperature, humidity, and VPD programming and having control of different fan speeds. This makes it so much easier to control my grow environment. Their Controller 69 Pro version also controls their oscillating fans, grow lights, and humidifier. The discount code MrGrowIt15 works on both Amazon and their website, acinfinity.com. Thanks to Mars Hydro for sponsoring this episode. Check out their Christmas sale that's going on right now. They have different products on sale each week. Everything from grow lights, grow tents, grow tent kits, ventilation systems, and more. They're also sending out gifts such as hats, shirts, and ceiling mats with orders, depending on your order price. Check out their website at mars-hydro.com and you can use the discount code MrGrowIt for a discount on any of their products. And we are back. Welcome to the Garden Talk Podcast. Today I am joined with Mr. Poodle420. How are you doing today? I'm very good, thanks. <laughs> thanks for joining. This is going to be a fantastic thumbnail. <laughs> Super sight. excited that you decided to disguise your identity and fit your character. Absolutely. You know, a pleasure to be here. But in order to get good quality sound, uh, we'll have you remove that mask and just have that other disguise that you have. All about the thumbnail, and and here we are back, back in the room. So, uh, yeah, totally, still, still hard to see who I am, but um, yeah, slightly less, slightly better audio. <laughs> exactly. So today we're going to talk about gorilla growing. You are a gorilla grower and have to implement stealth practices in order to be successful. So in this episode, I'd like to get into what you do. But first, how about an introduction? Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into gardening? Yeah, I think uh, I've been, been gardening, I think, probably sort of illegally for 20 years. Uh, I think for me, the, the, the sort of turn point was that sort of sense of quality. I think it comes down to that idea of, you know, the difference between a, a cake you bake yourself and one you buy from the shops. And I think the day you learn to bake a cake that is amazing, that you do it at home, you suddenly go, oh, hang on a second maybe there's another way and i think that's that's what it came down to medicinal plants that's for me was a sort of a, a, a bit of a sea change and i and you know i was buying medicinal plants in a, in a city where they were being adulterated the spice was a thing people are spraying stuff on that you sort of you, your option is one which sort of makes you feel like you're sort of having a mental breakdown because it's so strong and the sort of the philosophy of the people that are 
producing that medicinal plant is I want something that makes you do something. And it's, it's, that's not good. You know, it's, it's like being in a bar where they only sell spirits and all you want is a beer. So I think ultimately it's that, you know, the cake you bake yourself is the best. So that's what really brought me to the table and sort of access and sort of that quality and the, the lack of wanting to be anything to do with the criminality. And, the, you know, there's lots of things wrong with an illegal market. And ultimately, you take control of your that destiny and it's not difficult to do. And I think... I, th I think that's often for people a barrier is that sort of you get into a sort of habit you, you you're tapped into that illegal market and actually there's there's ways to do that that isn't a legal market and you can have that independence and the internet provides you with all the knowledge and there is a world outside there that you can just get involved and in. that's where the gorilla grow comes from and I think that's what I want to sort of convey and inspire people to think you know there's another way. You don't need to be involved in that criminality. You you can do things and you can get involved in doing things totally differently that takes you out of all of that and gives you just like, like you know, that home-baked cake experience um, when you've, you've only ever had shop or stuff. So, I mean, that's that's basically what I hope to inspire people to do. And, um, yeah, that's, that's where I come from. What exactly is Gorilla Growing and why do it? Well, I think uh, I think for a lot of people that maybe do, maybe maybe have no space, no, don't have a garden. They live in a city in a flat or in a, in a space where you don't have a garden, or maybe you live with a garden. And you 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 just couldn't grow stuff that maybe people would frown on. So there's the, that, and 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 if you live in a part of the world where maybe that's illegal then, you know, having stuff rooted in the ground, you know, or in a pot, or it's a liability. It makes you vulnerable. And I think the problem with all this sort of illegality, it makes you really vulnerable. And that can be a partner, that can be a friend, that can be all sorts of numbers of things that makes you really vulnerable. So if you've got it in, in the ground, in your garden, in your thing, whatever, you know, you don't get it with your neighbour, you, you're vulnerable. Whereas no one's ever been prosecuted for growing a tree in a forest. And that's that's what it comes down to. So maybe you don't have a good... Maybe you live in a flat in a city. And you're thinking, you know, I really like smoking. And, you know, it's it's expensive. And maybe maybe the cost of living crisis, it's a, it's a thing. But maybe you could go on a bus ride or a train ride and you're sort of suddenly in the countryside. And maybe you just go somewhere frequently and you, you find a place that you can put something in the ground and you, maybe you visit it once a week and... Hey, you know, the liability of that versus having it in your garden that's there every day and all the vulnerability that comes with that. Um, maybe that's a, a better alternative for you. And maybe that's something we can explore with this podcast this evening. Got it. How do you determine a good piece of land or a spot to grow in? Well, I think it comes down to, I mean, I think the best advice I could have is get yourself a dog. Or if you don't have a dog, buy yourself a dog lead. Because at least if you're found out in the world and you've got a dog, you can protect, at least pretend you're looking for your dog. But I think the thing about a dog is people see the dog and not the person. So if you're if you're out in the world, in the countryside, and you've got a dog, people see the dog, not the person. So that's a pretty good thing. And dogs are amazing for your mental health, amazing for just, like, your soul. I mean, they're a great thing, and why, why wouldn't you have a dog if you could? Um, but... But ultimately, it's it's about the, the, there's a lot of countryside that is available, and there's a lot of footpaths certainly in a lot of countries that you can go along and and you can find a space. And I suppose it's about going out there, finding something that's that's away off the footpath, a little bit hidden, a little bit discreet, no straight lines. You want to have a zigzag path. You want to find a spot that gets sun all day. You want to find somewhere that sort of, you know, now's a good time to go and look because you can sort of see what the growth was when it was sort of the the plants were all out and stuff. But you can sort of start to sneak in in through that and find a space that maybe could be perfect for your gorilla grow. That's pretty straightforward. And so once you identify a site to grow in or a piece of property, an area, how do you prepare that site? Well, I think. It, 
it's really important to visit that site many times of the day. You know, go there in the morning, go there in the evening, go there, go there sort of midday. You want to, you want to have optimum that, that peak time of the day where it's sort of optimum sun. You want it to be sunny. But you sort of ideally want it to be sunny all day. You want to be there from sort of dawn to dusk getting the sun. So it's sort of when you're scoping your site, you want to, that's, that's really what you're looking for. There's always a risk of people kind of finding you walking to that area or people identifying that, that site. How do you manage security and, uh, you know, camouflaging the area, right? Keeping the area camouflaged so people aren't able to see it. What do you do for that? Well, I think there's a, a few things that are sort of crucial for that. Number one, sort of have a, have a site where your entrance and exit are different. So if someone follows you, they're not going to see you come out of the same way you went in. Always have an in and an out. Uh, number two, the sort of security, just a sort of digital security. We all own a phone. That, that phone tracks you. When, you, when if, you, if, you, if you're into this project, turn your phone off. T t turn that, that location finding thing. That's your biggest sort of enemy in all of this. You get arrested. And I think there's a wider point on that. The phone is dead to you. Don't, don't get involved with that. Don't be there taking pictures, what's happening your friends, all that malarkey. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's a bad thing. And I think that's a wider point to be made there. Tell no one. This is, this, is, this is like a private project. You know, anyone you tell, that's a vulnerability. You know, your best friend, whatever. Anyone that doesn't need to know, doesn't need to know. You know, the, the, you only expose yourself to danger. And, you know, you can misjudge things. We're all used to misjudging things, and this is no different. And ultimately, if you tell no one, then there's no risk. You know, you tell everyone, then it's a good story. It's no one else is doing it. You know, oh, my friend, you know, oh, it just, it makes you vulnerable. It comes back to the whole thing. Because it's legal, it's vulnerable. It makes you vulnerable. I think that's what I'd say on that. I think one risk is the smell, right? I mean, these plants, they once they're in the flowering stage, they're giving off an aroma. Do you worry about the smell at all? Well, I think the smell more comes from the cure and the dry. I mean, it's, it's you know, the benefit of growing outdoors is there is, if you've got a good site and it's away from the people, there's the smell, yes, it's amazing, it's strong, it's whatever. But if you've got a good site, that's irrelevant. Where it comes into being a problem, maybe, is when it comes to drying it. And if you've got, you know, a kilo of a kilo of flour, or a couple of kilos of flour, and that's drying, that that smells. And I suppose that's more of your concern. And it's all very good to get all excited, and then suddenly you've got it in the bags, and it's like, oh my goodness, this smells. It really, really, really smells. <laughs> So I think having a plan of where you're going to dry that is far more important than worrying about the smell in the field. Understood. Now, back in the day in the United States, they used to have helicopters flying all over the place looking for gorilla grows and landing, chopping down plants, so on and so forth. Do you deal with any of that stuff where, where you live? Well, I, I, I suppose it, what I do is is not that common. People, I don't think there's thousands of people out there doing it. And I think the key is subtlety. Don't buy the plants that are like guaranteed like three meters tall. Go for, go small and plenty. You know, don't clear all the undergrowth of the way. Just just do it in a way that sort of blends in. You know, a medicinal plant and singing nettles look very similar from a distance. And if you don't clear it out, if you've got a clearing where it's sort of really obvious, then, yeah, sure, a drone or helicopter will see it. But if it's in amongst the other plants, it's sort of, it looks like stinging nettles. It could be anything. It's sort of a sort of green mass, isn't it? I mean, it, it seems nothing. Okay, gotcha. Now let's get deeper into actually growing the plants in the area. So, uh, first of all, do you grow autoflowers or photo period? And then do you start the plants indoors and then bring them outdoors? Or, or what's your process there? I think, I think for, for, for me, I've got a little LED grow light that I put over a truck. And I'll do maybe six plants at a time. And, then, and I'll do them in batches. And we'll go from zero, do a mix of auto and uh, feet, uh, photo. Uh, seeds i think it's sort of having that yin and the yang i think autos are great but you just don't get the same yield as you get off a photo period seed I, so i think it's it's nice to do a mixture of both um and i think 
you know, with hardening off and you want to put them out, you want to give them that chance to sort of get a bit more. But I think generally with, 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 with all of this, because you've got that long period of time, it gives you that opportunity to do a bit more of that training, a bit more of that um, manipulating the plant, if you, particularly with the photos. Whereas autos, you're sort of in and boom, it's three months or whatever, how long they have that long. So it's sort of nice to have a yin and the yang on that. How long are you vegging them indoors before you actually bring them to your outdoor location? Uh, I would say at least um, until you've got three tiers of plant high. Um, but probably that would probably be about a month to six weeks before we take them out into the into the grass. But I think what's interesting is that if as long as you get them in sort of well, really before August, they all become pretty similar size. And I think the sort of that idea of the sort of May the fourth being the day where if you want the big ones, right, well, you know what, I planted stuff end of June and they've been as big as the ones I put in in the beginning of May. You know, those sort of key months of sort of June, July, August really are what makes the difference. Now, do you bring out soil and use containers so they're they're grown in containers or are you taking the plants and then planting them directly in the ground at the spot that you chose? I started out when I, when I start doing this, I was sort of like, yeah, con- containers above ground, let's sort of own the soil. Actually, as I've got it, gone on, I've gone in the ground, and there's several reasons for that. So, fine, you've got a container. It's got a finite finite amount of space, and if you're putting all the mycorrhizas in there and you're sort of doing that whole organic, let's let's have a living soil. Actually, you need quite a big container for that to be a sustainable amount of living soil. You know, for that to, 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 for you not to have to keep adding the sort of microbes to keep it alive, you actually embrace the if you're doing it outdoors embrace the outdoors get involved you know get get in there and actually there's so much to be had from that you you're you're at the mercy of the, the environment well, i started out doing sort of raised things but i found there was two two factors number one they drew up drying out much quicker and and number two actually you you don't gain any of the benefit of having the wild involved in your growth you're sort of this sort of thing plonked in the middle of it. Whereas actually when you put it in the ground, suddenly you're tapped into the ecosystem. You're tapped into the environment. You're sort of the, you know, you're, you're part of nature. And actually that gives you loads of benefits. You know, it's very rare to see plants in nature that is overwhelmed by spider mites and other sort of pests. Actually, you, you get involved in it if it's a healthy plant, Actually, you're not worrying about the pest. There, there isn't all these things coming out. And, you know, I frequently look at my plants and there's lovely spiders and they're eating all sorts of stuff. And they sort of treat it as much as they do every other plant within that environment. And you sort of tapped into that both in the root system and both in, in terms of the sort of bugs that are eating the other bugs. So how many trips do you actually take to that location then? You know, you got to think equipment nutrients, all that stuff. How, how many, how often are you going like back and forth to that location? So I think for, for me, just sort of looking at how frequently you go, I, it uh, partly depends on how many plants you go. And I sort of want to speak to a little bit to that is, you know, I think uh, first of all, look at your, uh, I suppose there's a, there's a big question you've got to have that is if I get caught, how much are I prefer to get caught with? And I know that's a sort of funny question, but you know, we gotta you've got to assess the risks before you get involved in this and it's a commitment. You know, if you want to do gorilla growing, this isn't just like bang in a few seeds, turn up sort of three months later and woohoo, happy days. It doesn't work like that. It's like a sort of frequent visit. You've got to really work hard to get the yield. It's no less intensive than if you're growing indoors. The fact that sort of sun is free doesn't doesn't take away from the fact that actually it's a lot of work. If you're doing the training, you're doing all the other bits and bobs. It it it's a commitment. So in terms of the numbers, it, it's what are you prepared to do? I think you want at least once a week visit, and then. You want to bring your. I mean, for me, I I own the only thing I bring is nutrients. I don't bring water. The the, the 
God will do that with the rain. Um, but it's, so it's purely nutrients you bring in, and then it's how how many plants and how prepared to do that frequently. I um, the more plants you have, the more trips you're going to make. Um, I suppose that's and also how much of a risk you prefer. So you prefer to run twenty plants, you prefer to run six plants. I mean, look at your local guidelines. There'll be guidelines of what is acceptable is personal if it's illegal, and what's considered commercial. And I suppose it comes down to what do you prefer, what risk you prefer to take, what yield are you looking for? Um, I think in my country it's funny, six plants is considered personal, so I won't do more than six in any one site, but I may run several sites. Um, I suppose that's what it comes down to, and it's the effort you're prepared to put in. You know, I think this this season I'm probably getting at least half a gram for every litre of water I put in. A litre of um, feed I put in, which is a you know, pretty good return on investment in some respects. That's interesting. Yeah, I was going to ask you how often you go to water the plants. And, uh, you know, you bring up a good point. You're growing in the ground. So if they were in containers, they wouldn't have access to as much water as in the ground. Okay. If you're tapping into that sort of mycorrhiza sort of scenario, you want it to maybe tap into the woodland. Who knows what that lovely sort of thing that brings to your grow. I mean, that's stuff you can't you can't conceive. It's sort of, you're putting it out there a bit. And, and it's amazing sort of how much of a difference that makes. I started out growing in pots and actually you put it in the ground. It was just like, wow, there's a sort of depth to this that is just a bit special. Yeah, I mean, the microbes alone, I mean, the diversity of microbes in the soil that's there in the ground is way more than anything you're going to get out of a bag to soil. So, um, yeah, it's no surprise that you're seeing a better result planting in ground. Yeah, and it's great to do that. And I sort of feel, you know, it's, it's sort of where it should be and just sort of embrace the environment you're in and just sort of love it for what it is. But fertilizer, that's one thing where I want to get a little bit deeper into. Talk to us about what you – I know you said before we started recording this, you talked about how you're fully organic, 100% organic. And I just want to say before we get deep into it, thank you for being organic outdoors because there are so many issues with people using synthetic fertilizers over fertilizing and runoffs happening into our lakes and streams, which is causing toxic algae blooms. It's a huge issue around the world. And you going the organic route, you're helping with that. So first of all, thank you for not contributing to the, the pollution of our lakes and streams. For me, for me, it's like you're out there, you're, you'll work with it, not against it. I think for me also organic is just, it, it, there's no reason not to. Um, there's so many amazing products out there. And for me, BioBuzz is, is, the, is the, the, the one I go for. It's a Dutch company. They do amazing stuff. I do use the fish mix, which, jeez, those, those plants love it. I mean, if, you, if you're growing indoors, that's probably a bit smelly. But it, 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 it's an amazing product. And I do the bloom and I do the, uh, the Tomax that they produce. And those sort of three things, the, the thing I like about them is they're just pH balanced. So you, I don't bother having to worry about pH. Um, they're pretty much everything you need. I go with a few other supplements because um, do I need them really or not? I don't know, but I mean, I, probably the BioBuzz does it all. But you know, we're, we're 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 busy gardeners and we like to fiddle. So um, there's another product that I use that is like an Eco Thrive, and it's an organic thing for. Uh, uh, um, so I, I, I I'll break it down. So when it comes to the the whole, I'll dig compost in and then i'll add some bone meal and i'll add some back and i'll add some um fish fish and blood mix into that just a sort of base layer for the plant to sort of tuck into when it needs it and be a bit careful in that bag because you can burn the plants if you put too much in it you know you'll get the yellow tips so you know it's nice and then i'll top dress later with some of those products so, you know the Eco Thrive stuff is amazing, and and that's got all your gypsum, that's got your insect frass, that's got all those sort of lovely things. And back when I just I find really makes the makes the flowers taste amazing. So it's sort of it's a combination of both of those that sort of I go for. I mean, it's feeding the microbes ultimately, 
And I think you're trying to do that on several levels and sort of that gives your plant the sort of the best sort of mix of those two things. So it's sort of the stuff in the soil is when it needs it and the stuff you're watering regularly is sort of hopefully is sort of topping up on that. Got it. So you do an initial amending of nutrients. Some of those are slow release. A lot of them, it sounds like, are slow release. So that's going to break down over time and last you throughout the grow. But you're also doing a feeding with BioBuzz. Can you break down your BioBuzz feeding a little bit deeper? Specifically, I think you said once a week you're doing a feeding. Are you following the ratios on the actual feeding chart? Yeah, so I'm totally, I'm totally feeding into that. That what they say is what I'm sort of mixing in terms of those ratios. And a lot of people say, do do half what they say. And actually, I'm going full on. I'm just following what they say. I'm following their feed mix. And actually, I find that that's working. It, it, I'm, I'm seeing very little yellow tipping on my plants. I'm not seeing any sort of curling i i feel they they've nailed it they they do a very good job they're a fantastic company and that fish stuff man the plants absolutely love it i mean you're just getting you know you you go you know and and as a gorilla you you're not seeing them every day so you go once twice a week and you're like you come back and oh my god that's 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 grown loads it's amazing it's like it's just exciting i mean like i'm a kid in a candy shop I'm like, come back. Oh, my God, that's getting bigger and bigger. And I think, you know, um, yeah, ha- having having that organic matter coming in and, and having the balance of the two, you, it's sort of, I think, I think for me, that's a really happy compromise. It, 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 it works for me. You mentioned big plants. And I got to ask, how big are these plants? I don't think you mentioned when you're actually planting. What month are you planting them? And how big are the plants actually growing to? So, I mean, I think that the sort of May the 4th is the sort of time to get the big plants in. But I think you can get away with with um, June. You've got really big ones. You could get it in in June. Maybe you've, you've probably done six weeks before you plant it in June. So sort of work back from that. Um, I think I think for me, I don't choose strains that are like the sort of nine foot plants because actually I don't want something that's nine foot high. And for me, I think with, with there was a bit of it. There was a moment where... It, I I learned about training, and there was a time when they were like, "Well, they send the the, the hormone to the highest point in the plant." And I was just like, "Wow, that's canopy management for me." I just I know what that canopy needs to be now, and so I do a combination of sort of trellis stretching it out on a trellis and and just canes, and I'm pretty. The lovely thing about sort of growing outdoors is you've got time. That's the thing. You can you can really get it wrong, and it doesn't really matter. It will recover. You know, you get it wrong in June, or by the time August comes around, you know, it's recovered. They're pretty residual. They don't got it. You know, the the name they call it for nothing. I mean, it, it it's a robust plant that can really take some sort of thing. So I will do super cropping. I will do uh, lollipopping. I will do high stress training. I will pinch the plant and then bend it over, and then I will tie it to a cane. And the principle of having everything on a level playing field, making everything the same height, that's just, until it goes into flower, that's the one strategy you need to have. Make everything level. When it goes into flower, boom, your top coders are abounding. You know, that that was for me a real penny drop moment when someone just said, yeah, it just sends the hormone to the highest point in the plant. I just thought, wow. Everything's got to be the highest point. You mentioned you're doing super cropping. Do you also do any topping? If so, how often do you do the topping? Yeah, I suppose I suppose sort of topping is. I mean, I you know doing the topping is fairly crucial to sort of getting the maximum number of sort of things. So it's a combination of topping and training. And you sort of the more you do it, you sort of the you sort of learn that maybe is the one to do. Look at the plant. Be sort of organic with how it sort of is growing and sort of if there's particular ones that are growing up maybe that's the one to top and just sort of have a bit of a sense and i suppose you 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 it's such a long time so each of those plants you're sort of quite intimate with you you really learn them you learn what those plants are you sort of have that relationship with them and it sounds ridiculous but it it, it is that you're sort of looking you're saying oh that bit's going well there that bit, oh, if I crop that, it will go ding, ding, ding. 
So that, and, and I suppose that's it. It's that regular interaction with the plant. It's looking at it and just sort of reading it. And the more you do it, the more you'll learn. The more you'll see, you'll make mistakes. And that's the proof you're learning in some respects. Yeah, being patient with it, taking your time and doing the training, making sure all the training is done prior to it starting to flower can certainly be super key. I mean, you mentioned you're doing lollipopping, which a lot of people know the benefit. One of the big benefits of that is to eliminate all those larfy buds that grow towards the bottom part of the plant. So you, you mentioned you do lollipopping. Defoliation, do you do any of that at all? If so, when? Yeah, I do. I'm sort of dis, I, I do fe- defoliation. I, I think, you know, mold outside is your biggest worry. So you want to have that sort of canopy that has some air blowing through it. You know, I think there's a real danger if you let it. And and man, when they go into flower, it's like, woo, woo, there's pop, 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 pop. So having just rolling back from some of that, I, it doesn't need all those plant of leaves. You can take some of them out and managing that canopy, you know, ma- making sure it's just the top ones that are there that the energy is going to and just thinning it out. And I will stand above it and look down and see right what, what it's the lights on the on the buds is it blocking light on the bud it's gone 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 and and i think you just got to be on it frequently because it's amazing how much it grows have you ever had to like lose a plant because of like powdery mildew or have you come across bud rot or anything like that before yeah, I, mean, I mean i'd be very lucky i think what's interesting is if you've got healthy plants pests and bugs they don't tend to go for healthy plants. If you've got things that are a bit dodgy, a bit weak, yeah, they tend to go for that a lot more. So I think it's, it's you know, and you just can be unlucky. You can just get plagued by something and it will just take the plant. But ultimately, you know, take off the dead leaves. Anything with any colour of discoloration on, remove it. And that's really important because you can then see when you next come back, is there more of that plant with that, you know, that spotting on the leaves? You know, is it is it a cow mag deficiency? Is it a, a, a magnesium deficiency? You know, what what's coming through that? If you if you don't remove those, it's harder to tell. So I'd always recommend remove the dodgy looking leaves because that will give you an indication of it's more of a problem or it's the one off problem. That makes sense, and of course, the humidity is going to be a big impact on whether or not that stuff forms. What is the natural temperature and humidity at the location you grow at? Well, I mean, we're sort of northern hemisphere Europe. So, you know, you're at the mercy of the outdoor world. We're, we're wet, we're damp. I mean, this year has been amazing. I mean, I was, I had girls out there till end of November, you know, it's a beginning of November. I mean, you know, end of October, rather. And it's, it's a bit, it's been amazing this year. I mean, we, we can't really talk about climate change in a positive terms often, but I have to say where I live, wow. It's, uh, yeah, if this is climate change, happy profit. Now, you mentioned that you haven't really come across many pests. Are you doing anything to prevent pests? So like a lot of people do sprays that they do as like a preventative. Are you doing anything like that at all to your plants? Or are you just letting them go and hope for the best? <laughs> no, I, 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 I have historically done neem oil and done the sort of, you know, get into the spray, 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 which is fine. But I sort of, I sort of, but in, in the lab, embracing nature, let's just see what happens. And sure, if you've got pests, the best thing you can do if you've got pests is just take time to squidge them. You know, get on the plant, get the between your fingers and just go, the spider mites? Well, let's spend the next two hours squidging the spider mites on the plants. Um, but I'm finding that actually within nature, that and when you grow organic and when you grow wild, there's there's an abundance of pests and things to eat the pests. So I'll look at my plants and they'll be covered in spiders and you're like, oh, well, the spiders are taking care of the things. And, you know, every pest is also an opportunity for a predator. So there's that sort of natural balance, which maybe if you're in a, if you're a grow space, the spider mites get in, you're indoors, they're all over the plants. Well, there's nothing to really eat them unless you buy something off the internet to eat them. Whereas in the wild, you know, n- n- it's very rare to see a plant that's overwhelmed by pests. There's a normal natural balance. And actually what's been really interesting is growing outdoors, you see that. There's spiders on stuff. It's eating things. There's 
there's the sort of balance playing out in front of you. Yeah, you just have to deal with what Mother Nature brings you, right? <laughs> yeah, and you know, and if it comes big with the spider mite, then I'm I'm not I'm not adverse to treating that. But I, in my experience, I found that healthy plants tend not to have that much of a problem. And maybe I'm lucky. Maybe that's just how it is, or maybe that's a sort of yeah. <laughs> could be a thing and maybe next year i'll be like absolutely out there with the neem oil and the, all the other things trying to kill it all and well, you know i'm unlucky okay so you plant in may or june typically what months are you yep. harvesting so i mean I, I i like tend to play plant a sort of variation of sort of auto flowers semi autos and sort of photo period plants so you sort of want to have you know as much coming through the seasons different crops and different harvests but i mean this year's been amazing and i've been able to push stuff to sort of i'll do an initial an initial crop and then i'll leave it two weeks for the second flush so sort of let the plant recover so but really we're talking sort of mid-september if it's not an auto but auto you know you're just sort of counting the calendars to some extent and then how big are the plants when you harvest Oh, wow. Um, like, I'm wondering how you're getting these plants out of the location. I got to imagine that that could be difficult if you have a huge plant on your back and you're trying to get it out of the location. The best recommendation would be buy these. They are the, the, the bags that you can buy in the grocery store that you put your vegetables in. They're reusable and they're just the best. These, 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 these little bags and they're great for plants because if it's a bit wet, they're, it's breathing. It's got that air coming through it so these little sort of cloth sacks with the sort of yeah i'd recommend those for sort of managing it and actually when it comes down to it and you're managing that sort of numbers of plants it gets quite big you you you, you you're into rucksacks i mean i think taking them out camera bags are great because they have that sort of rigid structure and you can put the little plants in and i take camera bags are great for taking those sort of plants out to the site and then bringing them back, the the the, Hessian, the 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 web bags. I'd really recommend those. They're fantastic for for taking them. And and it's it, yeah, it's rucksack after rucksack. And you know, I will do a initial crop, and then I'll do two weeks later I'll do the second crop, and then maybe a third, of, depending on you know how many little buds there are that need a few more weeks. Um, so it's it's really tailored to the plant, just. To sort of be in touch with your plant, but they're sort of by that stage they're friends. They're old friends. You they've been in the ground for so many months. You you're sort of quite intimate with them. You you're watching every bit of them growing. You're training them. You're manipulating them to get the absolutely best out of them. And you know, I think um, yeah. By the time you come to crop, you you know which which ones you, which flowers you're taking first, which ones you're leaving, and yeah. I mean, it's having that just attention to detail okay so you just you're doing like a, a i want to say scattered harvest but that's not really the right way to to say it but you're you're harvesting like one plant at a time kind of so that way you can able to carry it out or are you harvesting them all yeah yeah i mean I'll do, well no I, I won't do them all i mean i'll do them basically when they're ready to go um i'll, I'll be playing close attention with the loop i'll be looking at well, when those plants are sort of starting to get a bit amber on the trichomes and just try and tailor it to the perfect time for the plant. That's ultimately what I'm looking for. Um, obviously there's limitations to sort of how much I can dry in my dry space at any one time. So there's a sort of, there, that is a factor within the, in the thing. But I think people have got to remember that basically when the best of us ever get given is like, when you think it's time to crop, wait three weeks. And that's so true. You know, you think it's the moment, and and you're sort of willing it on because you're like, I mean, you're always, always, obviously always keen for the weed, but you're sort of you're there and you're looking at it and you'll think, oh, it's the, the time. And actually, it's it's a three week window you can crop a plant. There is no now's got to be the moment. There isn't the perfect time. It's a window within which you'll guarantee that it will be good. Um, and I think you can get, yeah, you know, it's that whole snake oil, the bro science. There's all these things about sort of growing where they, it has to be this, it's going to be that. It's If you don't do that, you'll miss, it's, you know, 
there's a lot of that, but there's also just the reality, it doesn't really matter. And it'll be all right. And you'll still get high. So happy days. <laughs> So after you chop down your your plant and you, you're bringing it back home or, or wherever you're bringing it, drying and curing. Let's get into that a little bit. What, what do you do for drying? Like, what are your conditions? How is your drying area set up? Uh, so on and so forth. Yeah, I mean, I I, I I bought a product this year thinking, oh, yeah, you know, the bud dryer, you know, online. It's got a carbon filter. I mean, yeah, it, it doesn't stop the smell, yeah, at least. <laughs> <laughs> into secret, even though it's going to come filter, it's still absolutely honks. So I think you know having a, I think and I think you know you can be a gorilla grow and you can live in a flat, and you don't have the space to grow. And gorilla growing seems like the the best solution. I think my 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 warning to you is yes, it's amazing. You can grow a kilo of weed in the wild. No one will find you, but you know. Bring that back to your flat in some city somewhere. You know, have a plan for drying that. And when medicinal plants are drying, it's very smelly. The, the, the smell is quite prominent. Um, so be prepared for that. Have a plan for those two weeks where it goes from, you know, woohoo, I've got loads of it, to, oh my goodness, what the hell am I going to do with the smell? I hope no one notices. Because it comes back to that vulnerability, because all this stuff's illegal, you're vulnerable. And that can be from your partner, that can be from your neighbour, that can be from any number of sources that makes you vulnerable, whether they want to manipulate you, call the police, get one over on you, any of that stuff, you know. Don't underestimate how vulnerable you are. You may be the big dude, the whatever. It smells strongly. People recognise that smell. You know, there may be problems and things escalate really quickly. You don't think they will, but, you know, it can be a landowner deciding to detain you and calling calling the cops. It can be your landlord, you know, coming for a flat and expen- expen- you know, inspection and just clocking what's going on you know all these things it can unravel really quickly which is why i say if you're thinking about doing this and it's really easy to get down the rabbit hole and it's amazing and it's so much fun and it's it's so many good positive things it's amazing for your mental health it's it's all those good things and i can't recommend it highly enough but have an understanding of consequence and just have an exit plan you know, if it goes wrong and your neighbour complains about the smell, ha- have a friend that says, yeah, I've got a garage, you can put it in. You know, have an exit strategy because there's nothing more stressful than spending nine months producing the most amazing thing and then just like you're trapped between a partner saying, make it disappear and you, you, your neighbour going, I can smell medicinal plants and, you know, what are your options? Just have an exit plan. Have a plan B. I can't overemphasize that enough because there's nothing worse than having to make that disappear in a way that you you don't get to benefit from it. And you know, doing this stuff it takes a long time. It takes a lot of effort. It really, really does, and it's a commitment. So if you're sort of in with the thing and it's an amazing thing to do, but just at the back of your mind, have those things mapped out. Don't just go into it all sort of sketchy. Go, oh, it'll be fine. No, it won't be. You, you need to work it out because when they're when they're saying there's a problem, you gotta have a plan. Yeah, I know. One way to conserve the terpenes, obviously, the the smell coming off the plant is the terpenes volatizing, right? It, it's evaporating into the air, and that's what you're smelling. To conserve those terpenes, lowering the temp in your dry room. So I don't think you mentioned what temperature you usually aim for in your dry room or humidity. I mean, I I. I my control over that is sort of limited just because where it is but it's probably between 16 to 18 degrees is normally what it is it probably takes me sort of 10 days to two weeks for it to dry to a point where you can get it and i've i've I, this is the first year i've really gone for the growth bags and i, I have to say i mean wow amazing i mean just like it's been transformative i was in the mason jars and the burping and the thing oh my goodness what a hassle when you get to a sort of an, an outdoor grow where you've caught a, a sort of considerable quantity, where it's 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 not like a sort of a few ounces, you're like, you know, you're into sort of 40 ounces, you know, you're a kilo, you quite quickly get to the point where you're like, 
you need to manage that and that's a lot to manage and it can go wrong very quickly mold goes really quickly i mean i think i would say without door growing you know mold is your big enemy but just accept it it will happen it you've just got to plant more twice what you think you want and assume the heart you'll lose half the mold and you'll be fine but it, it comes and nothing goes in a jar without being looked at through a very very tight with it through a loop i'm there like literally every bud and it's easy to spot the mold so you know but just accept it's gonna happen and this has been amazing but you know to once the end of the harvest when you go for that second crop and it's sort of late october you know you may lose half of it to mold but you know just be on it um and don't just don't ignore it it's happening it's gonna come there's no getting away from it and just manage it as best you can that's good advice there wow yeah so we went through your your whole process there what you do when you're gorilla growing everything from uh, preparing the site for planting identifying a place to plant all the way through planting fertilizer watering all the way to harvesting drying and curing so um definitely an interesting process i'm mostly an indoor grower but i do have outdoor gardening experience and yeah there are some things that relate to indoors but there's a lot of differences growing outdoors and i appreciate you coming on and sharing what you do here on this podcast i know you want to be discreet here so uh there's not going to be any social media uh links down below or anything like usual like showing you around my garden and all that stuff but unfortunately the way the law is now i mean you know i think amazing america's done it amazing the germans are about to do it but you know we saw how road versus wade went the other way so don't be too confident it's it, i hope it's not a fleeting fleeting flash in the pan and i hope it's the start of the thin end of the wedge that changes everything because i think the world will be better for it so um yeah but it's nice to be involved in your forecast and hopefully I inspire some people, you know, because I think there's a lot of people out there that can't do a 4x4 tent, even if it is legal. And I think there's a lot of people out there who just have partners, family that just would never accept them doing that, even if it is legal. And and I think Gorilla Growing offers an opportunity to get out there to do something. And it's sort of, it's exciting. It's that rock and roll element of sort of, yeah, it, it enables you to have a project, go out there, and it it can be thrilling. It can be really just exhilarating. And I think it's really good for your mental health to have that secret gone, to be able to be out there and go, I'm just with my plants, I'm just hanging out. I think that's good for your soul. And I think, you know, consider it. And I think, uh, I think the industry is full of sort of snake oil and all of that stuff. But when it comes down to it, you know, you can do some really, you can go and do it. You don't, it's not about money. You can go and buy the pound store fertilizer. You can buy the pound store or the dollar store sort of bone meal. And you can do, you don't need to spend lots of money on sort of high end stuff. You know, ultimately spend the money on the genetics, get those seeds right. That's the bit to spend the money on. Ultimately, it will go and do boof. It will do boof, boof if you spend a bit more money. But ultimately, if you do enough of that, it will it will give you something and it will reward you and it will make your soul feel richer and your your life will be better for it. And, you know, don't be too paranoid in October, late September, October time. It will be fine. No one knows. <laughs> <laughs> I think those are some great final words. Once again, thanks, Mr. Poodle420 for coming on. I definitely appreciate your time today. My pleasure. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. I will do. Thank you. Peace out, everyone. Catch you in the next episode.